So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I hope that uh, my lecture here will uh, sort of uh, resonate with the rest of the talks. But I'm going to talk about a particular, uh, uh, a particular article or that was part of a manuscript that Engels wrote. And uh, I changed slightly, if you can see, the title of my talk, it's the part played by material culture, evol cultural evolution in the transition to humans. Material cultural evolution, not just cultural evolution. And before I start, I want to thank my friend and colleague and uh, like sister, uh, Anna Zeligowski for the art that you will see here. So in the next slide, I want to give just a few quot uh, quotations about the human hand. The human hand, which was central to Engels, next slide, please. The human hand, which was central to, to Engels' paper, the paper that I will be talking about, was central, uh, was, uh, was understood to be central to human life and human existence by other great uh, philosophers. So here is what Aristotle said. He said, it follows that the soul is analogous to the hand. For as the hand is a tool of tools, so the mind is the form of forms and sense the form of sensible things. And uh, Immanuel Kant is, uh, uh, this is a quote attributed to Immanuel Kant, it, it not found in anything he actually wrote but it is attributed to him. The hand is the visible part of the brain, he said. In the next slide, I want to explain what I'm going to do. So this, the paper that uh, Friedrich Engels wrote is an unfinished uh, essay, which is called The Part Played by Labor in the Transition from Ape to Men. He wrote it in 1876. And this paper focuses on the evolution of toolmaking and the role of toolmaking and the evolution of the hand as uh, the tool of tools, as the engine of human evolution. And my lecture here is a kind of dialogue with this paper. I start with Engels' account. What you will see in the terracotta colors is what Engels said or what I summarized that Engels said. And what you see in the black colors is what uh, researchers today uh, are, say, are saying. So what I'm trying to do, I cannot go into all the details of this paper because there are several subjects there that I, did not, I do not discuss in this lecture because of, I don't have enough time. I will be happy to talk about them if somebody will raise them, but I'm not going to talk about everything. But what I'm going to do is to talk about two main things, two main topics that Engels focused on. One is the hand as both the tool for making tools and the product of making tools, the biological evolved product of tool making. This is the first point that I, and the relationship of the evolution of the hand to the evolution of cognition, especially to the evolution of language. This is the first topic, and he talks quite a lot about it. The second topic is very, very relevant to what we are experiencing today. And this is the way that humans exploit nature that in, uh, in a kind, in a very short-sighted uh, manner, the way that capitalist economy is in fact destroying the world destroying uh, our ecology, destroying the planet. He talked about it in terms that are incredibly relevant today. This is the second part of his, uh, uh, of his talk. The two parts are of, course, are of course connected, but there are still two parts. Next slide, please. So I start with what Engels, uh, uh, what, uh, what Engels said. He starts, with the he, he starts with the transition from ape to men, and he says that the driving force of this transition was the decisive step was the transition to bipedal locomotion. And bipedal locomotion lends to evolution of the hands and to the evolution of tool making. And this is what made us human. 
What he says is that when bipedal locomotion became frequent and obligatory, and this was probably a long process, of course, his chronology is 19th century kind of chronology based on what he knew at the time, or what was known at the time. But when bipedal locomotion became frequent and obligatory, the hand was used in new ways. He says that he realized that there are already in the great ape precursors of this, uh, of, the, of using the hands. He knows that other, uh, that the other apes are uh, using their hands in very intelligent ways. But the hand of humans became dexterous because it was liberated from the function of using it for locomotion. And he says, the hand became free and could henceforth attain great, greater dexterity. The greater flexibility thus acquired was inherited and increased from generation to generation. He doesn't tell us how it, how it, uh, how it was uh, inherited and I will not go into it. He was a Lamarckian by the way, and a fairly naive Lamarckian, something that was quite common at that time. If you want, I will discuss it later, but I don't think that this is the most important thing in his, it, uh, but because we can also say that it was uh, inherited by cultural evolution, through cultural evolution, uh, because practices were inherited from one generation to the next. And this led to the selection of genetic mutations and genetic variation that supported this kind of flexibility, flexible hands. But it doesn't matter for us at the moment exactly how it was inherited. And then he says, he tells us after that, Thus, the hand is not only the organ of labor, it is also the product of labor. There is a positive feedback here. This is what he's telling us. Only by labor, by adaptation to new operations through the inheritance of muscles, ligaments, and over long periods of time, bones that had undergone special development and the ever renewed employment of this inherited finesse in new, more and more complicated operation have given the human hand high degree of perfection required to, uh, to conjure into being the pictures of Raphael, the statues of Thomas Walsden, and the music of Paganini. So what he's saying, look, on the one hand, we created the tools, the hand created tools. On the other hand, the creation of tools and more and more sophisticated tools, let's say through cumulative cultural evolution, led to the selection of more and more dexterous hands. And so there was a, and, and this led to the, to, to the production of even more complicated tools and so on and so forth. So there was a kind of positive feedback that led in the end uh, to the great, uh, to the great errors of musicians, of sculptors and of, and of painters. Next slide, please. What we see here is the tool of tools, the hand. And I'm just giving, showing it to you so that you will uh, remember what it is. We all have, uh, we all use our hands a lot, mainly for, uh, but maybe not enough, most of us, mainly for typing on the computer, but we can do a lot more with this. So here is the human hand and the human hand has uh, several special attributes about which I will speak shortly. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we can do, if you look at the two uh, uh, top figures, this we, we have a very good power grip and we have very good pad to pad uh, grip. So the pad of one finger and the pad of the thumb touch and we can grasp things in a very delicate way. The chimpanzee, for example, cannot do it. He can, uh, he, uh, he can, uh, he does, he does have a precision grip, but it is less good than ours because it is tip to tip precision grip, as you see in the bottom pick. This is one of the differences. We have very, we have very flexible hands, very powerful hands, and we can do a lot with these hands. They are very, they are quite different from those of the chimpanzee, but we will, we will come back to the chimpanzee soon. Can you please show the next slide? Right here, what we see is the family tree, our family tree. And what we know today, and that was of course not known during uh, the time that Engels wrote uh, his essay, was that we know today 
that already 3.5 million years ago, which is a long, long time, uh, during the times where the Australopithecines, not yet the Homo genus, a genus that was around before Homo, already three and a half million years ago, our ancestors, the hominins, manufactured tools. They didn't just use uh, stones for doing all kinds of things. This, the chimpanzees do that. They use tools, and they, but they modified them and they shaped them in a very simple way, but they did. They manufactured tools already three and a half million years ago. So tool making is very ancient. And I just want to tell you because, and I will come back to this point later, that this Australopithecine and other, hom and other hominins, for example, the, uh, the Paranthropus group, the robust hominins also uh, manufactured tools and they had a small brain. The size of, uh, in, uh, the, the, the size of the brain was no larger than that of a chimpanzee. Nevertheless, they manufactured tools. Can I, I have the next slide, please? Now, here we see several hands. Now, I would like you to look, I don't know if you see, the hand of uh, Australopithecus afarensis. From the left, the second hand, uh, the, the, second, uh, the second hand from the left at the top. This is the hand of this uh, hominins that were walking on the, on the planet three and a half million years ago. And if you look at this, uh, at this hand and the hand of Homo sapiens, which is at the bottom from the right, the second to the right, you see it, Homo sapiens? They are very similar. They are very similar hands. If you look at the size of the thumb, for example, it's similar. If you look at the, uh, uh, at the metacarpal bones, they, there are differences, but they are quite similar. They are very different. The hand of Homo sapiens, on the other hand, is different from the hand of the chimpanzee just next door to it on the left. The hand of the chimpanzee, for example, have a much shorter thumb, and there are other differences too. So already what we know is that already Australopithecus had a hand which was rather similar, not identical, but similar to the, to the modern human hand, and we also know that the chimpanzees have a different hand and we have to remember that they use their hands for walking. They do knuckle walking. They walk on their joints, on the joints of their hands. So their hands are not free. So what do people think today about the evolution of the hand? First of all, they said they agree, a lot, a lot of what I say agree with the Engels. Two major functional changes occurred during, human, uh, during the evolution of the human hand. The, low, the loss of locomotor uh, role. We don't use our hands to move for locomotion and the intensification of manipulation. Now, these two changes were not abrupt and they, ha they happened over considerable uh, spans of time and in different contexts. It, in, in different lineages. What we can also assume is that social learning and cultural evolution were part of the lifestyle of these hominins because they are part of the lifestyle of chimpanzees. So it is obvious that they were part of the lifestyle of, of, of these hominins who also created tools and we can see their tool culture. Uh, next slide, please. And what is very interesting is that our hand, the modern human hand is more similar to the hand of the common ancestors of human and chimpanzees than it is to the chimpanzee hands. So our hand retains some primitive characteristics. And the hand of the Australopithecines uh, about whom I talked previously, the ones that lived three and a half million years ago, have many of the features of the modern hand. And some of those are very similar to that of the last common ancestor between us and the apes. These features seem to have enabled the use of the hand for all, so the hand became free of locomotion, but it was already a hand that was 
better adapted to tool use than the chimpanzee hen because the chimpanzee hen went through particular evolution of its own. In the, in the chimpanzee line, there was greater divergence from the primitive co uh, last common ancestor hen than in the hominin line. And what is very important is that there were all kinds of changes that appeared in the modern human hand in the genus Homo, in our genus. About two million, that, you know, we start uh, talking about the genus Homo about two million years ago. So we have a very robust thumb, we have a great wrist mobility, we have a reorganization of the, of the bones here in the, car, in the carpal bones. In, we have straight phalanx, our fingers are straight. And all this appeared after, after stone tools first appeared. So first we have the, 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 the manufacturing of the tools and only afterwards do we have the modern human hand. And this supports this hypothesis that it was the intensification of making and using tools rather than the origin of tool use that drove much of the evolution of, the, of hand anatomy. So it's like he said, like Engel said that the hand is the product, the modern hand is the product in some ways of tool use. And enhanced manual dexterity and an enlarged brain and stone tool productions were not temporally synchronized. It is not clear from Engels what exactly he thinks about it. He doesn't go very much into it, but we know today that there is no synchronization between the evolution of the hand and the evolution, uh, and the evolution of the brain. Brain enlargement definitely followed to use. Okay, let's go back to Engels to, in the next slide. So what we know is that the evolution of the hand, now what, what the Engels tells us is that the evolution of the hand must have been correlated with the evolution of other parts of the anatomy. He's talking about the law of correlation of growth, that Darwin talked a lot about. He, he, of course, read Darwin and was very, very influenced by Darwin. And he suggests that tool making and the hand drove the evolution of human language and the evolution of the large human brain. And this is what he says, I'm quoting. The development of labor necessarily helped to bring the members of society close together by increasing cases of mutual support and joint activity and by making clear the advantage of this joint activity to each individual. In short, men in the making arrived at the point where they had something to say to each other. Necessity created the organ. The underdeveloped larynx of the ape was slowly but surely transformed by modulation to produce constantly more developed modulation and the organ of the mouth gradually learned to pronounce one articulate sound after another. First labor, after it, and then with it, speech. This were the two most essential stimuli under the influence of which the brain of the ape gradually changed into that of men, which for all its similarity is far larger and more perfect. So what he's telling us is that first of all, he makes the point that humans are very, very social species. All monkeys are very social and we come from uh, uh, our ancestors were very, very social for many, many millions of years. And the making of tools happened within this social context. And it happened within this social context. He doesn't tell us exactly what he means that suddenly people had something to say to each other, but we can imagine, for example, that if tool making involved teaching, then teaching involves communication. And the making of tools therefore involved the communication and communication may be more effective when you actually talk. So slowly, slowly, language somehow emerged. He doesn't go very much into it in, in the paper, but this is more or less the direction he's suggesting. We can have the next slide, please. He then argues that the enlargement of the brain led to increased sensory integration. So this uh, uh, language drove, and the use of the hand, drove the enlargement of the uh, brain. And that allowed uh, humans to make abstract concepts and to, uh, to understand causal inference, to make causal inferences. If this, then this. 
and it created a kind of positive loop. The more sophisticated the ability to use environmental resources through tool use, the greater the need for complex cognition. And this again allows further sophistication of uh, resource use and so on and so forth. So again, we have a kind of positive feedback between, the, uh, between practice and cognition, material culture and cognition. And the early tools at the time that, uh, now what do we know about the tools that humans created? At the time that Engels was writing, he said the tools were made for uh, hunting and fishing and the meat was very important. Uh, and it suggests that meat was a very important component of human uh, diet. And the meat diet has a, a great effect on, uh, on brain growth because it's a very good source of uh, energy. And, and, uh, it, and that in turn, he suggests, drove the domestication of fire, which further increased uh, the, our abil uh, the ability to extract, uh, uh, to extract energy from, uh, from food. Because uh, by cooking, we eat half digested food. And, uh, and uh, this allowed better and better resources that enabled humans to live in many places and in many climates. We had fire, people were beginning to make uh, clothes and so on. I mean, he is giving us a very big picture without too many details. He's jumping over hundreds and thousands uh, of years. Okay, now, next slide, please. Now, what do we know now about uh, these ideas of his? Well, did, is it, uh, to what extent was the hand pre-adapted for tool use and to what extent what did tool use make the hand? According to what we know now, according to the fossil record of the hands, which I must say is not very good, but we still have something, the answer is both pre-adapted hands and able to make simple tools. And the use of, uh, the use of these tools was uh, very good, we had a lot of beneficial effects and this uh, and it changed the life lifestyle of humans. And this uh, drove the evolution of the morphology uh, and physiology of the hand. So as he said, a positive feedback loop. And this, the, uh, the, we, we think today that there was a coevolution between genes and culture, cultural and genetic coevolution led to man manual and vocal dexterity, to emotional and ex executive control. So although the timeline that we, we have is much more detailed and we can say it took a very long time until the, the brain really became large, nevertheless, it did become large and it did uh, seem to have involved this increase in brain size, uh, uh, increased changes in the way in, uh, in, in both manual, in both circuits responsible for manual dexterity, vocal dexterity, the ability to produce sounds, emotion, and emotional and executive control. We know also that the tools that were created, that were manufactured by human already around 1.82 million years ago required teaching. You cannot make this tool just by trial and error on your own. You need to be taught, to be shown what to do. So this also tells us something about the highly social system that existed and about, and as we know all, we are all teachers, I guess, we know that teaching requires a lot of patience, <laughs> a lot of uh, emotional control. Next slide, please. So what do we know about the evolution of the brain and the relationship between the evolution of the brain and the evolution of the hand? So what we see here is a kind of series of skulls that show us the evolution of the brain. So if you are looking uh, at the skulls, you see that until something like 2.8 to 1.4 million years ago, most people are talking about 2 million years ago, until Homo habilis, the, the size of the brain was the same as the size of the chimpanzee brain. There were differences between the brains. There's a lot of uh, discussion about it because we don't have enough material, but there is something called endocast. Endocast is the inside of the skull where we have, we have kind of footprints 
of the organization of the brain. There aren't many of them, but what we do have suggests to some people that although the brain didn't grow in size for many, many, for a long, long time, it did change its organization. The organization of the brain was changed. And then with Homo habilis, we see a jump in, in the size of the brain, another jump with uh, Homo erectus, which lived until 70,000 years ago, between 1.8 million, 1 million until 70,000 million, and then a, another jump with Homo sapiens sapiens. We are not showing all, all the many cousins that we had on the, you know, the Neanderthals had a very big brain and so on, but we're not showing them here. But they also, they are cousins of ours. They're part of the uh, Homo sapiens lineage. Not sapiens sapiens, but sapiens Neanderthalis. Uh, okay, so what we see is the tool use and tool modification extends to tool manufacturing without a change in uh, brain size. And then we see a change in brain size and we see a great sophistication in, in the tools themselves. We do see that. The, the tools become such that, we that, that, that people have to learn how to, to manufacture them. They can't do that alone. Can we see the next slide, please? So here is what two specialists on this subject say about the issue of the evolution of the, of, the, uh, of the brain. Early members of the human clade combined a modern brain, great ape-like brain in terms of size, but incorporated structural reorganization that functionally re related to changes in cognition and visual spatial perception useful for control of upper limb movement and social learning. This early hominins exhibited human-like hand length proportion, facilitating advanced manipulation. Changes in brain and hand morphology were closely associated with other major structural changes in the body related to habitual bipedalism, and most certainly all constituted a part of complex adaptive sheep separating this bipedal apes from the rest. With time, tool behavior evolved in the human clade and their hands were co-opted regular stone tool culture in more encephalized uh, uh, hominids. It's a little bit, uh, can we have the next slide please? It's a little bit uh, sort of uh, maybe formal language, but basically it's very similar to, uh, to the kind of uh, large scenario that Engels was proposing. Now, what do we know today about the, uh, the relation between manual dexterity and language? It's very interesting. There is an area in the brain called IFG, which is involved in both language and in goal-oriented praxis, in the formation, in, in movements that are oriented towards a goal and that are hierarchically organized. So there is a shared circuit for both of these functions, the manual dexterity function, goal-oriented function, and uh, and the linguistic function. Can we have the next slide, please? The next slide, uh, ignore, please, everything that is written at the, uh, at the bottom. Anybody who wants to read it is welcome to do so later. But what we have here is the, the networks in the brain, in the cortex, that are involved in speech and tool use. And what is important for us to see here is if you are looking at the green part of the circuit, this is the shared circuit between manual dexterity and vocal dexterity. It takes part in both circuits, in both language and manual dexterity. The making of, com the making of complex tools or anything complex that we make with our hands, playing music, making pictures, whatever you like. Now, the blue part of the... Uh, the blue part of the, uh, the, uh, the parts in blue are the bits that are specific to the uh, 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 to language. And the parts in orange are the, are the parts of the circuits that are specific to uh, manual dexterity, to the use of the hand during this complicated kind of actions. So what we're seeing here is a very uh, convincing picture of the uh, interrelationship between manual dexterity and 
uh, and language. Can we have this next slide, please? Again, I think he was, would have been very, very happy. So what we have here is a kind of summary that it tells us that change, it's a summary of what we know today in our terms, which fit quite well in, some, in many ways, but of course extend greatly what Engels would have said. So we have changes in lifestyle. We became more bipedal for whatever. And this led to changes in hand use. And this changes in hand use led to changes in brain activity and in brain organization. This happens all the time, by the way. When we, when we, learn, langu uh, when we learn to read and write, there are reorganizations in the brain. When we learn new things, when uh, people uh, have accidents and then they have uh, to compensate for this accident, they recruit new parts of the brain in a new way. So always when we begin to do something new, that it involves a reorganization of the brain. This happens during development. It doesn't yet in involve necessarily any mutation or anything like that. And it is transmitted from one generation to the next through learning. But this also selects for any genetic variation that supports this kind of change. Any genetic variation that supports a change that allows, people, that allows the, uh, the animal, the human animal to use its hands in a better way will be selected for, obviously, and it will happen because there is a huge amount of variation in the population, genetic variation in the population. So this will be selected. This is genetic evolution. We start with, with developmental and cultural evolution, which leads to genetic evolution of supporting var genetic variation. And this leads, enables more motor learning and selection which is developmental selection, cultural selection, and also genetic selection, which which involves the size of the brain, longer development, more hand modification, more brain reorganization, teaching, handedness, you name it. And this is both genetic and cultural evolution. So what we see is that, that uh, and what is clear from this is that greater control of motor activities affects not only hands, but also face and throat muscles and the production of sounds, and we know from all I talked about uh, before, there is an actual neural connection between these two uh, uh, aspects. Can we have the next slide, please? Now, all this evolution that I was talking about is happening within a very, very, uh, so, uh, with a very rich uh, social uh, uh, species. And from the way that uh, Engels described it, and from the way that we understand these things today in our own terms, the evolution of the hand is an incontestable case of culture-driven evolution, material culture, evolution driven by material culture, which involved the construction of a new lifestyle and a new niche, a tool niche. And this led to the evolution of increased plasticity, human plasticity of the brain, to increased manual dexterity, and also to language. And we have this evolutionary spiral, co-evolutionary spiral between manual dexterity, linguistic communication, and gestural and vocal dexterity and the size of the brain. May I have the next slide, please? Now I come to the second part, and very interesting part, of Engels' manuscript, which deals with the effects of the enlargement of the brain on, on, on ecology. He's talking about the fact that humans construct their niche and destroy their niche. There is niche construction by humans. We create the, the niche in which we live, the ecological environment in which we live. And it is also the environment in which we are selected. And we also destroy it. And uh, this is, and he is, uh, and he thinks that this is because there is an increasing focus in uh, Western culture on, uh, on the separation between, between cognition and practice. There is a kind of, uh, the, it, it, it is a kind of idealistic point of view which, uh, which uh, be began to dominate human, uh, the human ide kind of ideology. And this, he, 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 he says, leads to very short term, uh, short and economical benefits with people favor what 
what is short, uh, what, what comes easily and uh, has have short term economical benefits, and uh, this uh, short term economical benefits very often have long term detrimental effects. And uh, he's, some of them are not intentional, the detrimental effects. For example, he's giving the example of uh, the invention of the steam engine that led to a greater control of communication and trade by, by, uh, by the rich. So it's reinforced capitalism. But some of them are intentional and they are, and they, and they are exploitative and they are the results of the careless capital careless and brutal capitalism. And he, and I'm quoting, what cared the Spanish planters in Cuba who burned down forests on the slopes of the mountains and obtained from the ashes sufficient fertilizer for one generation of very highly profitable coffee trees, what cared they uh, that heavy tropical rainfall afterwards washed away the unprotected upper stratum of the soil leaving behind only their rock? If it reminds you of something, I mean, this is what we're doing all the time. The destruction of the rainforest. This is what we're doing among other things. We're destroying the soil. We're destroying the very basis of our own, ex of our long-term existence for short-term benefit. Next slide, please. And he says, this, this is, and I'm going on to quote him. The individual capitalists who dominate production and exchange are able to concern themselves only with the most immediate useful effect of their action. Indeed, even this useful effect, in as much as it is a question of the usefulness of the article that is produced or exchange, retreats far into the background and the sole incentive becomes the profit to be made on selling. It's not even that the article has any use anymore. It's money, more money and more money. It's the profit. Next slide, please. And I want to finish with the life's last sentence of this unfinished manuscript. Well, it's not just quite the one pre-ultimate part of this lecture. What he said, what he's trying to plead, what he's trying to tell us, he's trying to connect an ecological thinking, an ecological kind of philosophy with a Marxist philosophy, Engels Marx philosophy, anti-capitalist philosophy. He's saying in relation to nature as to society, the present mode of production is predominantly concerned only about the immediate, the most tangible result. And then surprise is expressed that the more remote effects of actions directed to this end turned out to be quite different and mostly quite the opposite in character. That the harmony of supply and demand is transformed into the very reversed opposite. That private ownership based on one's own labor must of necessity develop into the ex expropriation of the workers while all wealth becomes more and more concentrated in the hands of non-workers. You cannot change, you cannot save the planet, you cannot make changes in ecology if you are not making political changes. These two things go together. And they go together with a certain, with, we have to break down a certain kind of philosophy, philosophy of nature. That's why it's so important for Engels to talk about the philosophy of nature, because the philosophy of nature and the economic philosophy of humans are, he understood them. Be, to be entangled. Next slide, please. So the denial, now what we see here is uh, the picture of the Anthropocene. It is also called uh, the Capitol Capitolocene, by the way. Uh, and what we understood, and you know, he could have written it yesterday because the denial of climate change the destruction of rainforests and Arctic zones for short-term benefits by, by ultra-capitalist big companies and, and politicians in, is what we see in our world. Look at Trump. We are very close to the tipping point of ecological, political, and social catastrophes and to a mass extinction that will destroy much of the planet. And as Engels pointed out, and as we, as people increasingly understand, the ecological and social political aspects are entangled. And this is really the last slide. If you can go back uh, one slide next. What he pleads and what he reminds us is this. At every step, we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside nature, but that we, with flesh, blood, and brain, 
belong to nature and exist in its midst, and that all our mastery of it consists in the fact that we have the advantage of all other creatures of being able to learn its laws and apply them correctly. And I, I've, and I finish with what uh, Richard Lewontin and Richard Levins, who dedicated the Dialectical Biologist book to Engels, wrote at the, in the, uh, as a dedication. They wrote to Friedrich Engels, who got it wrong a lot of the time, but who got it right where it counted. Thank you very much. Next slide, this is the last slide. Thank you. <laughs>